Welcome to Wines and Wonders with Kirsten Fox. True stories with a side of wine. Looking for inspiration for your life and your wine glass? This is your podcast. Here's Kirsten. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome to season one. We are calling this Beyond Coincidence. This season, I am sharing stories from my own life that indicate to me that there's a higher power watching over and guiding me, sometimes only visible in retrospect, sometimes that you just can't see that higher power when you're in the middle of the stuff. I'm not sure if you've been delivered these kinds of messages, but they're extremely helpful. And having survived a plane crash and cancer and my child with cancer and two divorces, I just depend on these messages um, from a higher power, God, whatever you want to call uh, something that's beyond us in a spiritual sense. And as an executive sommelier, I pair everything, all my life, everything that goes on to wine. So with each of these stories, I will always tell you about a cool wine. You'll learn a little bit and you'll have that to remember associated with the story as well. Today's show is called The Perks of Failure. In 2012, I decided to start a new company called the Culinary Wine Institute. I did this because I was teaching classes at my wine school, and students would tell me about botched wine presentations by servers around the area um, and at restaurants that they frequented. And So I thought, well, this could be an interesting company. So I started a company that offers online wine sales courses to help servers sell more wine confidently. They obviously then offer better service and they make themselves and the restaurant more money. So I launched this at the beginning of 2012. And in the first month, I had an opportunity to present this whole program to a large restaurant group in Salt Lake City. So after four weeks of meetings and presentations and me heading back to my office to develop the newest flyer that needed to be developed and handout in that, they decided to go with a live instructor um, for their wine training rather than my online courses. And I mean, I was super bummed. Um, I had spent a lot of money on this company, on on all these videos. Back in 2012, nobody was doing videos on an iPhone, that's for sure. And so I needed to get money coming in for the family really quickly. And at that point, I really didn't see any other option than to get a job. Um, And I mean, I figured I could still sell courses in my spare time. So I looked around, talked to people and find, and I looked for a job in the wine industry. And I did, I got a job as a sales rep for a huge liquor distributor called Southern Wine and Spirits. That's what they were called back in 2012. And, you know, of course I began filling out and all the higher, new hire forms and doing the training and such. I was still extremely sad to have lost, or to have to put my exciting new company basically on the back burner in order to work for someone else 40 hours a week. And I was a mom of three kids, married, and so I knew that that company wasn't going to get a lot of time on my, quote, free time. There's just not a lot of free time in my world past 40 hours that I was going to give them. So I settled in, and I drove around a lot in northern Utah. I had about 120 restaurants that I had to work with to make sure that the wines that the company just that my company distributed were considered to be placed on restaurants wine lists and certainly it's kind of cool cuz as an aside i listen to podcasts i mean sometimes i had 2 hour drives to get to my clients and so i would listen to podcasts and i just that's where i fell in love again with audio and what amazing stories we can paint um, in the theater of the mind okay but that's an aside So along with the new job, and I'm sure all of you have probably had new jobs in your life, and that is you have to change insurance companies. And that means sometimes you have to change doctors. And so here I am now having to change my primary care physician that I was perfectly happy with 
because I failed to land that big client and it was causing even more stress in my life at this point. And I was still bummed. So I was thinking about who I should go to and I'd seen a young doctor. She was super funny and I saw her at an urgent care facility at some point and I I wondered, I wonder, I remembered her name because she was so funny and I thought I'm going to look her up and believe it or not, she was on my plan. So I needed my annual exam and so I scheduled it with her and that was great. Well, I went in for my exam and she's again, really super funny. One of the funniest people I've ever met in my entire life. And so I was laughing through the exam and we're talking about family history and she's getting herself, you know, up to speed on what I'm doing in my life and what my health is and that. And she asked about breast cancer because she saw um, from my, the notes that I had a strong family history of breast cancer. And I said, yeah. I mean, she goes, what are you doing for preventive care? And I'm like, well, I, I do a mammogram every year. And then, I don't know, I guess about every three months or so, I check myself in the shower. And she said, okay. She said, have you ever had an MRI? And I was like, I've had MRIs on my knees and stuff, but I've never had an MRI on my breasts. And she said, well, MRIs are being used. Remember, she's a young doctor, so she's really up on everything new. And she said MRIs are being used for, in conjunction with um, mammograms for high-risk women. So I was like, okay, I just had a mammogram six months ago. And she said, no problem. Your insurance will pay for one mammogram a year and one MRI a year, and we'll just spread them out six months each so we keep an eye on everything. So, of course, I I went to this new hospital that I had to go to because that was covered under the plan, and I found the MRI department, and then they found a half-inch tumor in my right breast that turned out to be cancer, and that had already gotten into my lymph nodes. Fast forward a few weeks and I'm waiting in the prep room for my double mastectomy and I started thinking, what would have happened if I didn't fail at getting that big restaurant group as a client? What if I hadn't had to change doctors? What if I had gone along for two or three more years of a mammogram not picking up my tumor? How much farther would the cancer have gone? So what was something I had seen as a failure ended up being something that had saved my life. Of course, when we're in the middle of a downturn, crisis, challenge, it's almost impossible to see how it's going to benefit us in the long run. But on that kind of an experience in my life, I have learned to trust that everything happens for a reason And sometimes you won't know what the reason is until a long time after the bad thing, and you just have to be patient. I do, I must add, have a perfectly perky rack now. And believe me, at 56, that is a blessing I never, ever saw coming. I can wear bathing suits now that I would try on formally with my old rack and that would like the bathing suit, like push my breasts down to about my like waistline. And now they are all perky held up because they don't go, they're not going anywhere. I mean, they're not going anywhere. Um, So that's a nice perk. And I sometimes don't even have to wear a bra now, depending on the shirt and the dress. So I didn't know that was coming. So those are the perks of failure. Stay tuned to hear what type of wine Kirsten will pair with this story right after this. Today's podcast is brought to you by my company, Uplift Gift, when words aren't enough. When I had cancer, friends sent me the most amazing, wonderful gifts and cards, and they were from their hearts, and they made me feel so comforted and loved. And at the time, I was writing a column for the Huffington Post on wine pairings called Wines to Pair with Life. And so I wrote a series of articles about wines to pair with breast cancer. So in my public uh, eye, in the public you know, purview, people started contacting me saying, what should I send my friends? What were the best gifts when someone gets bad news? 
And finally, I just heard, you know, this message that said, this is, this is what you need to do, Kirsten. This is, this is your gift out of your cancer that you can give the rest of the world. So the, the company, again, is Uplift Gift. And we help you support your friends and loved ones who may be far away from you, who just are getting a divorce or are dealing with a parent dying or are struggling with a new diagnosis. I realized people need help talking to others who've been given bad news. Since I've been through that experience quite a few times in my life, I feel like the Uplift Gift uh, series of gift boxes are a perfect fit to help you support your friends. Uplift gift when words aren't enough. Next up, Kirsten's choice for a wine to open after the show. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. If you missed the first segment, I explained that I failed to get a big contract in my new company, so I had to look for a job. With the job came a new health plan, so I had to change doctors. The younger doctor that I had to go see after this suggested an MRI to keep an eye on my breasts because I have a high family history of breast cancer. And the first MRI that she sent me to found cancer that had already moved into my lymph nodes. And then a mammogram had missed just six months earlier. Basically, my failure to land the client saved my life. And now, I must say, I have permanently perky breasts after my double mastectomy forevermore. So I'm going to pair this story today with champagne. And I know you're thinking, oh, that's, I get it. You know, champagne, bubbles, celebration. But that is not the reason I'm pairing champagne to my story. I'm pairing champagne to this story because the creation of champagne basically came from an epic failure as well. So we're going to move back in time, and it's the 1600s, and we're up in the Champagne region of France where the Benedictine monks lived, and they were trying to produce wine like their brethren down in Bordeaux. They were taking the same types of grapes as Bordeaux, and they were trying to plant them up in the Champagne region. And these were all reds. Things that you're familiar with, Cabernet, Merlot, Petit Verdot, you might not be familiar with that, but Malbec. I mean, these are, these are solid red grapes. The problem for the Benedictine monks in Champagne is that they are located substantially further north than Bordeaux. So due to less daylight and warmth, the Bordeaux grapes they were trying to grow wouldn't ripen. They would stay super tart and undesirable, especially for wine. So they even experimented with other types of grapes and nothing was getting ripe enough to make good wine. Now, that wasn't their only problem up there because their vineyards and their wineries were so much further north, the winters were colder, oftentimes below freezing for really long periods of time. Now, fermentation of wine can only happen when it's warm enough for yeast to eat the sugar in the juice, yielding the byproduct of carbon dioxide and alcohol. And native yeasts begin fermenting the juice by eating the sugar, and that yields wine and carbon dioxide. But yeasts go dormant or they go to sleep when it gets really cold. And that halts fermentation. Back in the 1600s, nobody knew what was going on with fermentation. All the Benedictine monks up in Champagne knew was that their bros in Bordeaux picked the grapes in the fall, squeezed them, God turned the grapes, the grape juice to wine, they bottled it, and they enjoyed it the following year. But the monks in Champagne, they tried to follow the same schedule as the Bordeaux monks. In this case, in late fall, they picked the grapes. Once the fermentation stopped, once the yeast sto- it appeared the yeast stopped eating the sugar, in this case, it appeared, they appeared to stop, not actually stopped. The wine was bottled and put in the cellar for the winter, right? So picture this, it's 1703 and Dom Perignon's 
bro, uh, brother Pierre, goes down to check on the cellar in February. Now, there's been a thaw in the normally freezing temperatures. And as Brother Pierre walks into the cellar, and opens the door, creaks open the door, he feels that warm breeze rush into the cellar behind him. And he walks down the stairs with the candle flickering. And he looks into the cellar and the bottles appear fine, except that he jostles one of the bottles with the sleeve of his robe as he passes by it. Since the temperatures have warmed up, the invisible yeast cells in the bottle have awakened and they've been eating more of the sugar in the juice, yielding more carbon dioxide. And the pressure has been increasing in that bottle for a couple weeks as the gas builds up with no place to go. With that slight jostle, the bottle can't hold the pressure anymore and it explodes. And then, of course, once it explodes, it sets off a chain reaction and all the other bottles near it are shaken and they're exploding. And poor brother Pierre covers his face to protect him from all the flying glass. He runs up the stairs and he's scared and wondering how the devil got into the bottles that year. Well, these monks, just like me, were facing an epic failure here. It was not working for them. But these monks, just like me, learned that sometimes there are blessings to be found amid this disaster situation. The monks designed a baseball catcher's mask to go over their faces so that they could be down there and not be worried about if a bottle exploded shards going into their face. They also began using English glass bottles, which were built stronger than their French bottles. And so they could withstand the pressure of the bubbles that were building up in the wine. And they started to have this, no one else was producing bubbly wine in the 1600s. So they started to offer it to the royalty of France. And the middle class started seeing the royalty of France drinking this bubbly wine. And it became all the rage. And they basically learned the same lesson that I did. Of course, they learned it a lot earlier than I did. And that is that failure can lead to amazing discoveries and blessings. Next up, Kirsten's choice for a wine to open after the show. Thanks again to my company, Uplift Gift, for sponsoring the show today. And my choice for the wine that I would pair with my failure and the monk's failure is Veuve Clicquot Rosé Champagne. It is a coppery color. It's absolutely stunning in a glass. In the United States, it goes from between, say, $65 and $75. Um, It's in that range. It's got aromas of strawberries as you smell it. And then as you taste it, you'll get like that acid of wild strawberries on your palate. It's also full-bodied, so it will stay in your mouth and give you a long, enjoyable finish. It's just an amazing wine. And I think it's so fun that Veuve Clicquot um, has such an amazing story. So you may know that Veuve stands for widow, or it it's, um, means widow in French. Veuve Clicquot. So this means widow Clicquot. And um, her husband, Veuve Clicquot's husband died in 1805 when she was just 27 years old. Can you imagine? Talk about a scary, hard, sad, um, and and obviously the end of their marriage. Um, And she, at 27 in the early 1800s, took the family company and created a worldwide company that still stands today, over 200 years old. And so that is the wine I've selected to go with today's show called The Perks of Failures. I really appreciate you listening to me chat my story about a failure that became a blessing and my new perky rack paired to the failure of the Monks in Champagne and Veuve Clicquot Rosé Champagne. Thank you for tuning in to Wines and Wonders with Kirsten Fox. True stories with a side of wine.